Why is it that the chimpanzee shares more parts in common with me than with a dog? In part one of this series, we saw that the general structure of human and ape skulls seems to converge on a common plan. We also saw that a commitment to a general common design apologetic doesn't provide all of the answers, and that it may be more fruitful to look to principles in structural design. So let's dig in now and take a look. It may surprise you to learn that the notion of structural continuity existing across the entire class of vertebrates was first proposed by creationists before it was by Darwin. Richard Owen was one of the most well-known and respected biologists of his day, and like many scientists at that time, he was a Christian and a creationist. Owen was one of the first to recognize a structural thread that seemed to weave its way through the vertebrates, and was convinced that some kind of sequence existed from lower vertebrates all the way to higher vertebrates, including man. Of course, as a creationist, Owen did not believe in what at that time was called transmutation and later evolution. He means that the continuity one sees in the vertebrates, starting from fish, moving up to amphibians and reptiles, then to mammals, and finally to man, should not be understood using laws of evolution, but should rather be grounded in a creative plan that linked organisms together until they pinnacled in the creation of man. Owen's model of continuity was built on something that he called the archetype. The archetype was an abstract idea in the mind of God from which God built all vertebrates in a progressive sequence that ended with man. Simplistically, Owen's fundamental archetypal design was first and foremost a single vertebra, and it was from this conceptual bone that God then designed an entire archetypal skeleton. This conceptual skeleton thus became the blueprint upon which all other vertebrates, including humans, were built. He says this, Now, however, the recognition of an ideal exemplar for the vertebrate animals proves that the knowledge of such a being as man must have existed before man appeared. For the divine mind which planned the archetype also foreknew all its modifications. Now keep in mind that metaphysical ideas such as this were pretty popular in late 18th and 19th century scientific circles, with such notables as Johann von Goethe, Etne Geoffroy St. Hilaire, and Frederick von Baer, among many, many others. Now all of these scientists were influenced by a philosophical system of thought called nature philosophy, which itself was equally influenced by the theory of forms put forward by Socrates and later developed by Plato. These metaphysical solutions to biological questions, they fell out of favor, however, after Darwin published his book on the origin of species. Scientists were looking for real biological ancestors, and so dismissed abstract or conceptual ones, even if they were designed by God. You will be surprised to discover, as was I, that Charles Darwin, so passionately committed as he was to materialist-only explanations, actually usurped Richard Owen's archetype and made it into a real evolutionary ancestor for all vertebrates. <laughs> Listen to what Stephen Jay Gould says. Darwin had struck a blow to the heart of Owen's system by substituting a flesh and blood ancestor, a concrete beastly thing for the lovely abstract platonic archetype. Historians of science, including Gould, all agree that Darwin's inspiration for a single common ancestor actually comes from Owen's archetype. Owen is even credited for first describing homologous structures, a word that today relates similar anatomical features to a single common ancestor. Owen, however, believed that homologous structures should point the scientist back to a single conceptual design, not a single common ancestor. I mean, this is utterly 
fascinating because it means that Charles Darwin utilized a creationist's idea and even some of his terminology to formulate and describe what we now call the universal common ancestor. Notably, Owen's archetype and nature philosophy in general not only fell out of favor in the sciences, it didn't even show up again in Christian circles. For those ardent creationists out there, when was the last time that you heard of Owen's archetype or thought about 19th century nature philosophy. Given this scientific and philosophical background, I will in part three attempt to solve the dilemma I raised earlier in part one and provide a creationist hypothesis as to why the skull bones in apes and humans tend towards a common plan. Okay, so that's all from me here, Ken Coulson at Creation Unfolding. If you thought that this video was helpful, then it would be incredibly supportive if you could, of course, hit the like button, subscribe, and ring the bell. But I think the greatest support that you could possibly provide me is prayer. If you could pray right now, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you and goodbye.